Hello, 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 St. Louis. Hello, Strange Loop. I'm so excited to be here, y'all don't even understand. Um, this is my first time in St. Louis, my first time at Strange Loop. I want to thank the folks uh, that accepted my talk. Uh, <laughs> and I want to thank you for investing your afternoon to hear a subject about data privacy and data trust. So I want to start by saying I'm not a lawyer, nor do I aspire to be. I am a product manager, uh, basically. And so I'm going to click. There we go. We're going to cover a couple, a, a lot here. Um, we're, and so we'll just jump right into it. We're going to define the, the, the lay of the land, uh, the, the the evolving landscape of data privacy. We're gonna talk about, in the context of developing software applications in 2019, what we mean by data privacy and what we mean by data trust. I have this concept called the three C's that we have to consider. That's concept, context, choice, and control. And there's a bonus that we're gonna talk about in the end, respect. So at the end of this 40 or so minutes, um, I hope that you'll take away to your offices or your desks on Monday two things. Uh, one, what the, how we got here, what has happened in the context of data privacy and data trust, where we are today, and what it's going to be like in the future. Secondly, I want to sort of weave this narrative by example. So you actually have tangible and practical ideas to take with you as you're building. And that as you're building your software or refining your, your, your features, you understand that we're, your users aren't just shedding information, they're sharing information with you. And, and that we need to be good stewards of their data. It's, their data, it's my data, it's your data, right? So let's get into it. The obligatory, who am I and why am I here? Um, I am a veteran, I like to think I'm a veteran product strategist, product manager. Uh, I've pretty much spanned the gamut of anything product, from product engineering to product design, product marketing. I've been doing this for about 13 years. I, for the last seven years, have been focused on immersive technologies and emerging technologies. So the second link that is not my name is the OpenAR Cloud, which is a volunteer organization that is starting to think about some of these best practices, privacy patterns, I like to call them, that we can bring to augmented reality, virtual reality, and the OpenAR Cloud, or the augmented reality cloud, which is basically like Amazon or metaverse, if you would, for AR. If you're interested in that subject, kindly follow us. If you're interested in more of this uh, talk, uh, kindly follow me. Who here remembers Google Glass? Wow. Yeah, I was one of those glass holes. <laughs> right? I um, would prance around back in 2012 being one of the first people in my little corner of the world wearing Google Glass. And given that I was one of the first people to wear it, I would get a lot of offers to talk about developing software for Google Glass. I put together this ethics and uh, um, criteria by which people should sort of govern themselves when they walked around with Google Glass, because if you remember, there was a lot of tension around people walking around with face computers recording us, right? And at one such event, when um, I get invited to Berlin to talk about designing for glass, wake up in the morning, pull up my computer, a little on Google Maps, I uh, see how long it's going to get to the airport, pack, you know, I order some food, hop in the, the Uber, get to the airport, you know. And then I got on the plane. 
And as I put my bags up and I sat down, the flight attendant came to me and says, take that off. I go, wait, what, why? I literally have my prescriptions on here. I'm not, like, I need these glasses. And she goes, you're making people uncomfortable. There is a passenger that is complaining. So I go, oh, wait a second. I went through my whole diatribe as to how glass worked. I explained that in order to record everyone, technology would have had to make a breakthrough with batteries, right? A tiny face computer would have to be on the entire time, which without burning my face. Um, I would actually have to stare at you the entire time and look like some sort of creep. It would be socially awkward for me as well. She wasn't buying any of that. Meanwhile, folks around me, whipping out their phones recording this entire conversation, I found it hilarious. <laughs> so in order not to get kicked off that flight, I took off my prescriptions, and I kept it off for the rest of the flight. That was actually tame compared to other events that happened to other glass holes. Folks got punched in the face in the middle of the bar, you know? Um, and so, uh, like, subways in San Francisco was just awful uh, to people wearing face computers. I've actually heard people talking about that with ear pods. It's like, I will slap somebody's face straight clean off if I walk around somebody listening to me or, or recording my conversations with one of those ear pods. It sounds silly, right? Maybe not. Because it was at that point that I actually started realizing that we were renegotiating norms as a society. It wasn't about surveillance, me recording you. It wasn't about the ridiculous concept that I was just coming out of an airport boarding a plane and the person complaining would have gone through the same security surveillance gauntlet that we all do when we go through airports, right? So it wasn't about me recording you. It was about the company, Google, behind the device. What happened to that data? As a, as a data subject or as a normal human being, do I have control over what happens with my information? No. Do I have the choice to opt out? It's kind of hard physically, even walking around and I have my phone out. You are going to be, you know, might be captured in a frame or two if I am recording. Um, and so it wasn't about surveillance. It wasn't about surveillance. It was about trust. It was about trust in what happened, that control, that choice, that context and awareness. So we're going to talk about that today because when we build our wares, we need to understand that we have gone through and are going through new norms. Folks are woke around their data, right? By show of hands, how many people here feel in control of their data online? Wow. OK, I'll ask it a different way. Are you clear on what data is being shared um, when you use your banking app? Show of hands. You're clear. That's awesome. That, that's, that's awesome. So, so the data is a little, it doesn't go in that favor uh, because consumers' trust is at an all-time low. And this adversely affects the value that we deliver to our customers. It affects the success of our products. And so we need to foster an environment of mutual trust and bridge that trust gap that exists today. Uh, it's all, I, I was having this conversation with someone else at this conference, and I realized, uh, at a previous conference, sorry, I realized that humans have always got it right the first time. Back in the day when it cost like $3,000 for five megs. We were really, really, really good at not retaining data in perpetuity, right? We, 
would, you know, I don't know how, how old folks are here, you'd have your tape back up, you take it home, make sure you have a copy of it outside uh, the building in case there was a fire, and then when you brought it back up, it was wiped, right? We only stored information when we needed it, we discarded it when we didn't. We get it right the first time, humanity does. Um, think about the electric car, Teslas, and all kinds of new EVs roaming around, but we, humanity actually rolled out automobiles with EVs, this is not new. Like, we get it right the first time. Today, data is ubiquitous, right? So data is cheap. We can store things for free on Dropbox. And so we have quickly found, we've quickly learned as corporations, as apps, that if we're able to temper the velocity, the variety, and the volume of data that we have, we gain a competitive advantage. So we have to hoard all the data, even if we don't need it. Let's define some things before we move on, because uh, I've talked about a couple of things. I've talked about data privacy. I've got talked about data trust. I'll be remiss if I don't sort of define it in context of this conversation to this audience. By the way, show of hands developers in this room, almost everyone, designers, researchers or data analysts. All right, this is a very engineering skewed room. That's great, because I'm gonna tackle this from a design perspective, balance you out. So what's data trust? Data trust is the sum of data transparency, value delivery, and consequence acceptance. What do I mean by that? So we all build our apps and we deliver some, ideally, some level of value. If it's a painkiller, that means your users can't go a day without using your solution. If it's a vitamin, they can come in and out. If it's candy, it's a game, but it's a value being delivered, right? But again, trust is what happens when you sum up data transparency with it. How much context are you providing your, your, your users um, with that? And if you are transparent with what's happening with that data, I assure you that you earn more trust when something goes wrong when that inevitable breach happens, right? Because you afford the confidence that you, the, 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 the vendor or the app builder, are gonna do right by your customer. When Tim Apple shows up on the stage, I believe his name is, he comes in and starts talking about the importance of data trust. But then it turns out that Siri, in order to, for Siri to be improved, well, they have to have humans listen to subsets of that information. That should be transparent. But guess what? I love Tim Apple and I love iPhones and unfortunately I'm using a Dell, but I love a Mac better. And so I accept the consequence if there is a breach, okay? So that's trust. When we talk about data privacy, on the other hand, that is a dependency. Oh, that is a, the outcome of trust, right? And so data privacy, we're not talking about encryption. We're not talking about security, though they're somewhat interlinked. We're talking about control, the sum, again, of control, context, choice, and respect. And we're gonna go deeper on that uh, here shortly. But we're not, certainly not talking about who owns, is this my private data? Because I'll give you an anecdote. If I went on 23andMe today, and I decided to learn more about my genealogy, my lineage, uh, I will shed some personal information, my, uh, uh, my DNA, and I will learn about my history. Well, what if my mother or my brother doesn't want that information public. Do I own that data? Does my mother own that data? 
does 23andMe own that data? That is not the context by which we're talking about. We're talking about what we do when users, data subjects, share information with us with consent, informed consent. So let's talk, let's sh give, shift gears a bit and talk about where we are, where we, how we've gotten here. Uh, we get breaches every single day. Equifax makes sure that you have to jump through fire in order to get $125 or whatever, but I'm still getting that money. I don't care if it's 15, <laughs> I don't care if it's 15 cents. Um, right now, I've drawn my blood and all that stuff, I think, is part of the requirements on Article 15. So, yes, we know that big data gives us a competitive advantage, and thus, there has been an explosion of data. There has been a rise in the variety of data that we can use to build valuable things for our customer. There has been a rise in the velocity, the speed by which that data comes to us, and it's, the more it is, the better. And we temper that with the volume of the data that we have, and we kind of want to keep it forever, because you never know when marketing might need it, right? Well, cause and effect. Rise in data, rise in breaches. Well, I get breached, now I'm almost jaded. It's like, ah, yet again. OPM, Capital One, if you are in the US, the credit card company. Every other day, have I been pwned.com? It's bookmarked. Right? Definitely check out have I been pwned.com, great resource. Well, as a data subject, as a human being, I hire, I, I hire, I put people in office, right, when I vote. And though I complain to them and say, hey, person in power, your data is also breached. Go protect us, because the companies don't really have the ethics to govern themselves. So guess what? There's a growth in data regulations. Guess what? The EU is woke now. If you've ever heard of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, I'm sure you would, I think if you're playing bingo in this, um, in this talk, you've probably gotten all the uh, checks. Well, GDPR is a result of years. There's normally a, a misnomer that GDPR went into effect last year. It actually went into, into effect in 2014. It was enforced last year. Right? It actually is an evolution of other DPAs, the data protection uh, amendments that started in the UK, spilled it into the EU. But this GDPR is a far-reaching um, regulation, meaning Ade sitting right there. If you were to hop on a flight, the airport, hang out in Brussels for two weeks, guess what? You have superpowers. You can require the consent of whatever information that you know, Facebook wants from you. I'm going to pick on Facebook a lot today. Um, you, can, you have superpowers. You can ask for what information people have on you. You can ask for people to fix issues with what data they have exposed to you that you know they have. And you can request for them to purge that information. right? And you can bet that these regulations are set up in a way that regardless of who you are, and again, this is not triangulated to the EU states. This is a long arm jurisdiction kind of law, meaning if you want to do business with someone who lives there, you have to comply. Now, when I say comply, there comes the lawyers. They go, yes, is this feature GDPR compliant? Let's send out 1,500 emails to all of our users back in May 2015 to let them know that our privacy policy has changed. Boom, we're, privacy, we're GDPR compliant, done. Not the case. It is a burden. We look at that as a burden. Because for, for the longest time, developers, designers, business owners have looked at sh the information that our users shed was a trade-off. It was a zero-sum game. Meaning, I'm giving you a free service or some value service that you will pay for. Right? And so, guess what? That information is ours. It's my currency. Well, that's wrong. There's some positive, some opportunities that come with 
sharing, be, being transparent, providing the context, providing controls, and providing the choice and overall respect of your users' data. We talk about personally identifiable data. I've said data about 1,500 times in the short period, nine minutes. I'm talking about one or more of your name, addresses, emails, IP, addresses, national ID, or if I'm building some sort of app, my you know, sensitive information, which is not GDPR compliant, but other regulations uh, have that in, in, in place, sensitive information like place of birth, race and eth ethnicity, menstrual cycles, those are sensitive bits of information, right? You're providing some sort of value, but you should be able to classify these. Now, how do you do that? I want to sort of, um, sort of, before we get into that, I want to sort of summary. So we're talking about context, you know, how transparent you are. We're talking about control, you know, how do you address the growing, I'm sorry, the, the, what accessible features do you provide within your uh, pro product uh, to, to allow them to control whatever choices you give them. Uh, and, and, and again, that sort of feeds off of each other, okay? So we're gonna sort of dive into each one of those. Pri data privacy, in order to afford data trust, doesn't begin when you onboard your user. It is actually the entire life cycle of your app, right? It starts with onboarding. And so let's look at onboarding for a second. These are some transparency considerations that your research team or your design team might you know, go through when they're going through that little design flow, uh, you know, discover, learn, use, goal, right? I basically sort of twisted that a little bit to sort of fit how you would think about building your app uh, with privacy by design at, at the forefront. You know, how clear are you in communicating uh, when your data would be used? These are things, this is a question you should ask as your sort of your vision statement, for example, when it comes to thinking about context. You know, how, is, is my, <laughs> Is, is my uh, privacy promise sort of clearly articulated? Are there options for me to provide consent uh, as a user? Uh, can I take back consent tomorrow, right? Do I have that choice? How accessible are those controls? How easy are those controls to find, right? And when I do get this information that's shared, Right, because again, it's positive sum, right, not zero sum. That's shared. Do I afford that consequence acceptance driver? Do I respect that data? Do I treat that data as if um, I don't depend that zero, zero trust? Meaning, I don't want to just assume that Stripe is going to just take care of all the security on the financial part of my app, or that Amazon is just going to be secure on, that, uh, on the uh, uh, infrastructure side of my app. We see what happened if, you're if you've been following this space with Capital One, pretty large technology com fintech company. You would think they would know how to Amazon or AWS. Turns out they didn't. So we're diving into the first subject, context. And when I say context, I want some clear reason why you need my information as one definition of that context. There's always this joke that I love to throw up here that Adam and Eve uh, didn't even read Apple terms and conditions. And if you look at iTunes and try to read those terms and conditions, I love Tim Apple, by the way, uh, but I, I'm not reading Macbeth through and through. Um, 20,000 words, not, I don't have time for that. I ain't got time for that. So I'm not reading uh, that, nor I'm sure have any of you, right? Again, context also bleeds into how we design the information that we gather throughout the entire journey of every task that we expect our users 
to accomplish. One method that I found very useful is something that I've seen games do very effectively. So this is concept for progressive disclosure. When I'm filling out a DMV form online, I'm barraged with a million fields. And that's because I, you know, as a data person at the, you know, the, the Department of Motor Vehicles, I may need this information at some point versus the approach where you progressively collect that information as there is a need. One example of that is a fictional restaurant that provides an app uh, to rate um, at the end of an experience, to rate the quality of the, of the ambience or of the environment or of the food. And I get to rate it. Uh, it's a very simple thing. Technically, you don't need my name. The job to be done for an analyst is to translate to product or the engineering team where to improve the tool in this example. Do I really need John Smith's name, email, birth certificate, uh, social security number? Believe it or not, people do collect that. But maybe there's added value. There is a justified reason for me to then re-engage with someone who rated this very high or rated it very low. How can we be better? Well, one medium is email. So then optionally, you can provide this little field here uh, to do that. Not required, it's good practice. There are positive sum opportunities to do good by your customers. There are positive sum opportunities to provide the right context to your, to your users. Uh, this story uh, is, from, is about Facebook. I love Facebook. I used to love Facebook. I don't have a Facebook account anymore. Um, what they did right, they have this facial recognition feature that they launched. It's still available in the app today, I'm sure. What they did right was identify a need. I'm at this conference. If I turned around and took a selfie, click, and shared this on my fictional Facebook account, if I got this gentleman right here's good side, and he's also on Facebook, Facebook would let the gentleman who's opted into that feature know, hey, you were at this location, and someone took a picture, guess what? You're in it. Do you want to tag yourself, or do you want this picture? By the way, who owns that picture? Anybody? Facebook. Oh, you read the terms and conditions. Good job. <laughs> so uh, that's, a, that's a good need. I, I want to know, right? I'm fallible. I'm like walking around the arch and stuff. I'm on a little nerdy scooter. Lucas over here was uh, making fun of me. Well, maybe somebody took a picture and I've got this nice little move that I was doing and I'd like to know about it. Great need. However, it, the value delivered was buried in legalese. Nobody reads this shit. Right? And what's more, it was opt-in first. Surprise, surprise. And then you have to go find it and turn it off. There are positive sum opportunities. That was wasted. And we, we have to be bold, because sometimes when we are sharing this information, it might be, oh, well, you're sharing trade secrets. No, no, just be open first. Be open first because people are going to be shocked. Wow, all my data about where I've walked around and driven is available on Google Maps? Freak out. They read an article and then just rage tweet. Google knows everything. Well, after that dies off and you actually sort of see the value, you turn off your location because that's what the article in that blog said. And then you pull out Google Maps and you try to find your way around and you realize it takes five minutes for it to triangulate where you are. You realize, maybe I should just turn it on. So that outrage just died off after 24 hours, right? Uh, well, I find a history of everywhere I've been very useful, right? 
I can turn it off when I want. I have the choice. I have the context as to how it's being used, at least within the context, no pun intended, of this product. Let's talk about choice. When I say choice, I mean, do I have agency over my information, over my data? Oops. I just, okay, fine. You, you guys already seen it. So, I don't have an Instagram account, nor, actually, I had to do have an Instagram account. I love taking pictures. Apparently, um, uh, Mark, Facebook also um, owns that company. But one other company that they own is uh, WhatsApp. When I did have a WhatsApp account, and I was nerding out on GDPR, by the way, a bit about me, back to my intro, that 2012 event that sort of just got me focused on, on data privacy was just a catalyst, was just a spark. The 2016 elections where we found out that you know, data was, you know, certain policies, Facebook policies were violated and a third party actually took that data and ran with it. Cambridge Analytica, if you've probably heard, uh, was my sort of just torches and pick, pickaxes, we're, we're about to storm the, the door. I started writing a lot of articles, I started giving a lot of talks. But I tried to, to find what information at that point, what uh, WhatsApp had on me. The only option I had was to delete my account, which I did. I wanna be able to rectify any issues if I know, if I have the context, and I want the choice to be able to opt out of something or another. another power of choice is to be able to liberate my data. Uh, right, basically, you, you deserve the right to sort of lift and take your data somewhere else, right? Uh, and this is the apocryphal story of, of one of the things that was done right by Google. Uh, they're large enough that they do a lot of things right and they do a lot of things wrong. But being able to provide that liberation of that data in a format that your user can actually use. Right. Talk about control. So that flight that I was uh, talking about before was to talk about how I built this fitness app for um, personal trainers. And personal trainers would you know, prescribe workouts or circuits for their customers. And if their per customers were wearing uh, a face computer or an I uh, Apple Watch, they could opt in to share biometric information, their pace, their intensity, and whether they completed a workout in order to afford the personal trainer with additional insights in order to help you achieve your fitness goals. Great idea, right? But it was scary. Um, we were collecting a lot more information than we needed, I'll tell you that much. If I were to do that over again, let's go through a thought exercise. How would I provide my We've talked about context and we've talked about we're talking about choice now. Well, for context, at some point, if my users needed a safe state session, uh, they would need to share an email uh, and their name so, and, and obviously secure it. So we provide the context. But controls would be part of my flow, not when they first got to the app, but when they needed to access certain features of the app. So in this case, you'll notice that LinksFit's privacy consent has not been set up. So you haven't consented yet. Note that this is diff far different from the, oh, we're tracking cookies, yes, I accept. Right? When they do click on that feature, you know that 19,000 word terms of service? What I've tried to do here is make this a little bit more interactive, right? What I'm trying to say here is that that terms and conditions mentions things that we expect to collect, like personal information, social media information, cookies. Well, guess what? I don't really, really need social media information. So then provide the option for them to take it off. This is literally an interactive version of a terms of service or a privacy promise. Same with cookies. I need cookies, everybody loves cookies, in order to improve the application. But I get to turn that off. 
right? So same, but there, of course, I just want to be clear that there are going to be some functionalities or some terms that as a business, you are justified in collecting. So then disable that, right? So say, for example, personal information, I need to make sure that no one's sort of fraudulently using my app. So I need some information. And so I've made it very clear as to what that information is. Take this a step further. Explain further what that information is used for. Name, surname, and email. There's some, this is a pro tip, there's some tools that do it for you. Um, some of those tools are OneTrust, CookieBot, Nimnity. Just type in cookie compliance module. But I'd, I don't really know what's happening behind the scenes because it's ironic, but they're not also clear as to what happens to that data. So I'd say roll your own, zero trust, right? Respect of your user's information. But definitely be inspired by how smarter people than me have gone about solving this problem. Every design or research talk has double diamonds. I'm not going to uh, anchor too much on this in respect to time. But uh, during your problem space, uh, when you are understanding and empathizing with your users, include a, what we call a data discovery. Do an audit. Try to find out the volume. Understand the volume of your data. Understand the variety of data that you have. Understand how often that data comes in, okay? Do what we call a PIA or DPIA, data protection impact assessment, Google it. Send that to your sysadmins, your data nerds, just have them just let us know if we do not already know, maybe they already have that information. And then from that, do a gap analysis, do a risk register. Build out a data lineage map. It's going to look like spaghetti, depending on how complex your app is. But based on that, you want to start cataloging that data. There are lots of tools to help you catalog data. Now you're in the solution space. You want to start using tools like Calibra or Alation or roll your own with BigQuery and start listening to events come in. That enables your business analysts with metadata to understand what actual technical rows and tables are and whether who changed those and how often those rows are updated. That allows you to limit and set policies as to how long you should keep this information. Oh, here is a, a, a row that we've never really needed. Why is that in our schematic? Why do we ever need it? And then someone from marketing goes, oh, well, in, in, uh, during Christmas, we actually need this information because we're going to sell, sell them some widgets. And you go, well, well we need it just in time, JIT. I'm sorry for all the marketing Americans. Some of my best friends are marketing Americans. Um, so I love marketers. I, I really do. They know how to sell things that I didn't build. Uh, so yes, so refine, and then ship, and then build during your implementation. Learn, and then do it all over again. Let's talk about respect, that bonus that I was talking about. Uh, and it's all about building that trust up. You know, what can you do to show that you're a good steward of data internally, not externally facing necessarily? Because with some of these regulations, you're required to respond 72 hours, GDPR for example, 72 hours when there's a breach. And it doesn't matter if the processor of that information, like their host, is uh, you know, Amazon or Azure or Google Cloud, it doesn't matter. Friday, something goes wrong, Monday, you better be telling an ICO or, or some data privacy body in, in a country that has been affected, right? Or else 4% of your annual revenue is a death sentence to a startup, 20 million euros, definitely a, not a drop in a bucket for some of these larger firms. And every other day, if you've been following, some of these larger firms are going through a lot of heartburn. So I've talked about zero trust. I'm not going to anchor on that. Uh, but there's other ways Fortunately, that you can glean information from your customers in order to improve your application. Because we're saying, oh, well, afford them the control and the context and the trust. And of course, you start thinking, well, that means I can't really, I don't really know how people are using my app, right? 
In 2006, in 2006 uh, there was a white paper about something called differential privacy, uh, and before then, a lot of research had been done. And Tim Apple came on stage last year, and, and um, by the way, if you say a joke like three times, it kills every single time. Um, he came on stage and talked about how Apple was improving the iPhone with something called differential privacy. And I got all my research from the fancy, uh, they took that white paper, changed a bunch of words, used a lot of pictures, and now I'm an expert. I'm not. Um, but the whole idea is that you can de-identify anonymized data. So if I can actually, um, if I share my information uh, with you as a uh, software and you want to be a good steward of my information, one approach would be to anonymize that information. Well, two things happen. If you have a vulnerability or something happens where you have to roll back that data, guess what, I reappear. Um, what's more, a quick story, Netflix uh, a couple years ago decided to release a massive data set of movie reviews. Yes, they took an extra step to de-identify, basically, and, I'm sorry, to um, anonymize their, um, their data set, right? So you don't know that it's Noble who loves Strange Love or Strange Loop whatever it is, and that's a movie, right? Um, I haven't had a lot of sleep. Anyway, so, and then of course they scramble the ratings too, just as an extra layer of security. It just took a couple months and a couple of researchers were able to map that to individuals by mapping that data set with IMDB's data set. So the point of differential privacy is to add noise to your data, scramble that data, at the point of, of the edge on your device before sending it off to a server. And statistically, you're able to sort of discern trends, essentially. Differential privacy, talk to your, your statistical friends. They probably can explain it way better than I. But it goes into improving how your data is used. Say, for example, if you ever use the Google Maps feature where you're about to book a, 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 a show up at a restaurant and want to book it, and they tell you this is not the right time to show up here, um, they are able to improve and add value without tying that to you or your ID. And if you're ambitious and you know C, C++, definitely give uh, differential privacy a look on GitHub. It's been open sourced, so yay. Landing the plane now. Uh, I promised I was gonna talk to you about consent. Because affirmative consent, being collecting consent, um, and this picture will make sense in a second, I promise. Collecting consent uh, is very important. It ties to that trust, right? It ties the, uh, the data, the, the context. You know, uh, I'm able to know what I'm consenting to because it's transparent. I'm able to provide the controls to my user so that they can actually opt out and say, I do not consent, right? Uh, and, and, and the choice, obviously, that comes with that uh, action to control. So I'm actually gonna recontextualize my, the way I think about consent and why I think consent is the most important subject when it comes to grokking the concept of data privacy. This is my daughter, I can't tell you her name, and she lives with me. Um, I put her in the care of teachers, caretakers, to show her a good time, to teach her, and to feed her. That is the agreement. I am the parent. That's not controversial, right? Standard. However, if the teacher school wants to go outside of the bounds of this, like take my daughter to the theme park or the swimming pool or give her some different kind of food than I've, than I've signed off of, they come to me. Why? Because I'm the parent, right? You get it? See where I'm going with this? It's my data, right, as a user. If I share that with you, Facebook, use it for the terms that we agreed upon. 
And if you should use it for outside of the bounds of that agreement, like share it with Cambridge Analytica, I think I should know. And so this is a call to arms. The call to arms are basically asking you in this room to build, bake in context, control, choice, and overall respect of your user's data. Because guess what, it's not your currency. It's ours, the users, the data subjects, okay? This is the future that we want to build because our users are getting jaded. We're losing so much value because we do not respect our, data, our users or their data. That is unfortunate. And the market will judge us based on how we respect our users' data. I will make these slides available. Uh, this is where I got a lot of my research on uh, NIST privacy framework, IEEE. Obviously, I've read a lot of the GDPR end-to-end -end over wine. Um, we, th we give the Canadians credit for privacy by design and Kovorkian um, and, and others. I'm a big fan of Nathan Kinch. This is a name that you should look up if you're nerding out like me on data privacy and you're as passionate about the subject. And again, TensorFlow, uh, Google's open sourced uh, the data privacy library, and of course you can use TensorFlow, a machine learning library to do that. So thank you and stay woke.